Psychologists studying autism spectrum disorder have been fascinated for years by a peculiar phenomenon. Even before autism was a recognized diagnosis, the psychologist studying it observed that boys were four to five times more likely to show symptoms than girls. This has led researchers to wonder whether it's a sign of innate psychological differences between the sexes, or just a quirk of autism's particular epidemiology. The more we learn about autism, the more complex this question becomes. On the one hand, autism does seem like an extreme manifestation of archetypal male traits. Autistic people are generally characterized by difficulty socializing and expressing emotions, yet may be quite adept in math, engineering, and other traditionally male pursuits. Some psychologists believe it is not simply a disorder, but rather a combination of exaggerated personality traits already correlated with a male sex. And autism is a spectrum, of course. It's not black or white. Individuals can have any combination of traits in any degree, just like they can have any combination of stereotypically male traits and female traits. On the other hand, genetic research indicates that symptoms of autism are correlated with mutations of many different genes, many of which are on the X chromosome, meaning the disorder might potentially be X-linked. This is a complicated subject, but in simple terms, some types of mutations on the X chromosome can potentially affect males more intensely than they affect females, while mutations on the Y chromosome can have no effect on females at all, since females lack a Y chromosome. Males only have one X chromosome, so each male cell only has one copy of each X-linked allele. If one of these alleles happens to be crucial for the synthesis of an important enzyme and it is mutated, there won't be another allele to pick up its slack. This can be potentially lethal in certain cases. In other cases, it may cause learning disabilities, birth defects, and some research already indicates a potential link to autism. In these cases, the genetic disorder is called Fragile X Syndrome. A female could potentially inherit such a dangerous allele from her mother, but since she has two X chromosomes, she will also inherit her father's allele. In many cases, one functional allele is good enough to perform the required function. This means females are more likely to be asymptomatic carriers of X-linked traits than males, due to having a second chance at a functional allele. A male could potentially be diagnosed with severe autism, yet have a female identical twin without any symptoms of the disorder. We don't yet know how all these mutations function, and there seem to be other non-genetic causes for autism as well. But there's a good chance that X-linked traits explain some amount of the gender imbalance. At the same time, we have to ask what functions these alleles actually perform. Some psychologists suspect that these alleles might not only be the cause of the gender imbalance in autism, they might also contribute to the personality differences between males and females in general. It's possible that through studying the extreme case of autism, researchers have serendipitously stumbled upon a mechanism for psychological sex differences. Needless to say, this entire subject is highly controversial. After all, it relates to both sex differences and to psychological disorders. And like many questions in Evo Psych, it is right at the frontiers of human knowledge. It might challenge beliefs or upset sensibilities, but it's still a question worth asking, and evolutionary psychologists are searching for its answer. A theory advanced by Simon Baron Cohen has proposed that some of the cognitive and behavioral features of autism can be considered a cognitive style rather than a deficit, and that this cognitive style can be characterized as an extreme version of the cognitive style demonstrated by clinically normal males. We know, for example, that males are worse than females on some of the tests where people with autism show impairment, such as theory of mind tests. Empathizing E is similar to theory of mind, it is a predilection to explain entities in terms of mental states, such as thoughts, beliefs, and emotions. And males are better than females on tests where people with autism show better than expected performance, such as the embedded figures test. Systemizing, S, represents this tendency to explain entities as rule-governed systems and a preoccupation with classification. Examples of such entities include mechanical artifacts, weather systems, mathematical and musical notations, political and social systems. Typically, when we think of people, we think of them in empathizing terms, that is, as entities that can be explained by considering their thoughts, beliefs, and emotional states. 
Inanimate objects and events such as a clock are usually explained in systemizing terms. So we don't usually think of clocks as wanting to tell the time or believing that it is half past four. In Baron Cohen's account, systemizing and empathizing are independent cognitive styles. So one could be high on one and low on the other, high on both or low on both. The figure is a hypothetical diagram of how empathizing and systemizing vary. A person with high E and S would be towards the upper right-hand corner. A person low on E but high on S, such as a person with autism, would be towards the lower right-hand corner. According to Baron Cohen's theory, women would, on average, be towards the top left-hand quadrant, with men typically towards the lower right. There are very clear sex differences in the brain, and we see these differences right from, from birth. Some people wonder whether these differences in the size of the brain or in the size of different parts of the brain have any impact on uh, the child's psychological development. And certainly we know that girls talk earlier than boys, their language is developing faster, and the regions of the brain that are involved in language are larger in females than in males. The finding that the amygdala is larger in boys is interesting because in boys and girls' social development, their understanding of other people's emotions, girls seem to develop faster, their empathy is better on average, and this may well relate to this difference in the size of the amygdala. Our research has been looking at whether children and indeed adults with autism might have an extreme of the male brain. So autism is a developmental condition where people have difficulty in developing friendships, relationships, communication, but where they also get very focused, uh, sometimes called uh, obsessional. And uh, we've been interested to see whether the structure of the autistic brain might be an extreme of what we see in the typical male. When you compare groups of children with autism and without autism, Children with autism show uh, faster brain development, sometimes thought of as an overgrowth in the early years. And when you actually compare different parts of the brain, some structures fit this extreme male pattern. So the amygdala, which is larger in a typical male, is even larger in a child with autism. The corpus callosum, which is larger in a typical female, is even smaller in a child with autism. But we're also looking at these uh, patterns in, in terms of psychology. So do children with autism show a profile that would match an extreme male profile? If it's the case that boys are developing slower socially and in terms of language, well then it's very clear that children with autism are developing social relationships and language even more slowly. So in that respect it does seem to fit some of the differences in the way the, the mind develops in boys and girls and the way the brain develops in boys and girls may reflect genetic differences. And if genes are involved, then uh, it's only one small step to imagine that these may have been shaped by evolution, selected by evolution. And one view is that, in fact, in our early ancestry, our hominid ancestry, Males and females occupied very different niches, different roles, with females taking much more of a role in childcare and in the community, uh, much more of a social role, and with males having a much more of a solitary role in navigation of the landscape in search of resources. My own position is that I think biology and culture interact to create these sex differences. So I'm not a strong biological determinist, but neither am I a strong cultural or social determinist. I think there's a mix that comes together to create them. There are some people who would argue just for biology or just for culture, but I think the moderate position is to recognize that both are at work. I think there's a responsibility for people who look at sex differences to do so in a very careful, evidence-based way. It's very easy to make sweeping statements about groups of people, uh, including the two sexes, uh, which could easily become uh, forms of discrimination or generalizations which simply don't apply. 
Um, so research in this area, I think, can proceed, but it has to be very responsible. It has to be done in a responsible fashion. So not claiming more than can be reasonably claimed on the basis of evidence. Infants of only a few days old will orient towards face-like stimuli. It appears that even at this early stage, there are reliable, if small, sex differences. More recent research on day-old babies confirms that boys look longer than girls at a mobile, while girls look longer than boys at faces. At 12 months, girls engage in more eye contact with their mother than boys, with the amount of eye contact being inversely related to the level of prenatal testosterone to which children were exposed. Hoffman, for instance, found that infant girls respond with greater empathy than boys to distress observed in other people. Simner demonstrated that infant girls are more likely than boys to cry when exposed to the cry of another infant, but no more likely to cry, for instance, after a loud noise. Cross-cultural research suggests that females of all ages are more person-centered and males more object-centered. Across the span, females are more attracted to intimate relationships than are males, and are more concerned with love and intimacy in sexual relationships. Boys are more likely than girls to choose toys that are susceptible to systemizing, such as construction kits and mechanical objects such as cars and trucks. Rhesus monkeys with no prior experience show a similar sex bias when allowed to play with human toys. Males are better at tasks involving 3D construction and are better at mental rotation tasks. Men are more interested in classifying animate and inanimate objects. Scott Atron conducted research among the Agua Runa of northern Peru on intuitive classification systems of local plants. It was found that men showed a greater number of subcategories and their classification schemes were more consistent with one another than the schemes of women. Many of the occupations that rely on systemizing show a higher proportion of males and females, including metalworking, construction work, and engineering. Men may have experienced a selection pressure to develop systemizing in order to make better tools or develop better hunting strategies, with females likely having experienced a selection pressure in order to help rear children. Alternatively, the difference could be the result of sexual selection. David Geary suggests that superior empathizing ability in females might be the result of female-female competition. Girls and women compete by gathering as much information on other people as they can get and then using this information to attempt to organize their web of social relationships, to have better control of these relationships and access to what they want. What about autism? What does it mean to say that the brains of people with autism are extreme versions of male brains? Could autism, especially high-functioning autism and Asperger's syndrome, be an adaptive phenotype? Or is it a genuine deficit, albeit one that has some assets, such as higher systemizing? Like people with autism, animals tend to notice small details in the environment, details that clinically normal people would miss completely. Evidence from Alan Snyder's laboratory at the University of Sydney suggests that normal people can exhibit savant-like skills if certain regions of the brain are temporarily knocked out. This is achieved through a non-invasive technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS which uses a rapidly fluctuating magnetic field to induce weak electric currents in particular brain regions. This can either stimulate or block the action of neurons in these areas. These results might suggest that we are all capable of savant-like skills of high degrees of systemizing, but other brain regions block this ability. If this is true, it might support Grandin's assertion that becoming less autistic-like was one of the changes that happened to humans as they evolved.